Welcome to A Canadian Investing in the U.S., a podcast and YouTube channel focused on Canadians buying real estate with host Glenn Sutherland. Welcome to another episode of A Canadian Investing in the U.S. Uh, this week, our guest is Nick Van Dyke. Um, Nick, tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe your story, and we'll uh, we'll get into this. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Um, so, yeah, my story, I guess I'll try to make it short and sweet because I tend to I tend to blab a lot but nonetheless uh, so I am from southwestern Ontario a Canadian um, and you know we started in multifamily properties you know in Ontario and stuff like that and then we got a we ended up buying an apartment building out in Edmonton and then this last year we ended up uh, <clears throat> uh, going down to Florida we planned a three week three week vacation did not plan on buying any properties. We, you know, we literally just, we were locked in our house for too long and we said, you know, let's go to Florida and, and enjoy, enjoy the weather. So uh, that three week trip turned into three months and we ended up <laughs> buying uh, two short term uh, rental properties in Florida. And, um, you know, we met you, I met someone else down there and a bunch of other people, real estate stuff. And now we're developing some self storage uh, facilities in, in Houston, Texas. So awesome. yeah, one thing led to another. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, I don't know. What do you want to start with the start? Let's start with the, the short term rentals. You went down there, uh, you bought some short term rentals. Uh, maybe we'll talk about how, how did you find these? What'd you buy? How are you managing these, these from a distance? And Maybe maybe I'll maybe I'll save my questions or break them down. But maybe how how did you find your first uh, short term down there? Yeah, honestly, yeah. Uh, so we we ended so like I said, we we, we planned originally a three week trip. We were just going to go to Orlando. I think we were going to go to Orlando, Naples, uh, St. Pete, and head home. But we ended up going to land Orlando to Naples to St. Pete back to Orlando. Um, I think then we went down to Cape Coral then. I, we were all over the place. Like it was literally just, but while we were there, you know, we're there during the high season and I'm like, you know, we're staying at Airbnbs and I'm like, these places, you know, I'm paying for it. So I'm like, you know, we're, they're charging, you know, an arm and a leg for these properties. And I'm like, you know, I, I, it's just, you know, a natural real estate investor. I think it's, it doesn't matter where you go. You just yeah. look up, you know, realtor and you look up properties and you, you just start crunching numbers and that's exactly what we did. So, um, you know, long story short, we ended up buying two properties in Cape Coral, just uh, uh, basically Cape Coral for, for your audience, essentially is between uh, uh, like Tampa Bay, Naples, you know, on that coast. Uh, and then recently we dealt with Hurricane Ian, which is a whole nother topic. But um, <laughs> but yeah, no, we, we bought properties out there and uh, the number like our dollar went a little further in that location. And and yeah. Cool. So you, so you found some properties down there. Um, was there, um, was it like, how'd you pick this thing? Was it just like what you liked the look of, or was there a certain area or like, yeah. what was your criteria for, for this property or two properties? So, yeah. So basically we, like we evaluated like all these different cities and stuff like Orlando, St. Pete, Naples, all of that stuff. Um, but we, we, we ended up buying in Cape Coral just cause it was more, more friendly to, um, Airbnbs, just like all of Cape Coral is allowed, you're allowed to do Airbnbs versus in like, uh, near Tampa or St. Pete, there's, you know, there's certain pockets that you're allowed and not allowed and all that other stuff. So, um, plus, you know, you're, what you're buying, like we ended up buying, uh, two properties there, three bedroom, two baths, you know, you know, nice neighborhood, um, with a pool and, you know, they're, you know, favorable for people who are going on vacation for you know, your typical family. Right. So plus like we wanted something like we were looking at Orlando and we we're comparing like properties, um, what we bought in Cape Coral versus Orlando, like within a resort setting. But like, I don't know, I, for my investments, I always like to hedge myself because, you know, okay, worst case scenario, something happens and you can't do short-term rentals like Hurricane Ian right now. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, so now it's like, okay, well, you know, what's what's plan B? So now, now we're renting it to like long-term people who basically, you know, they're renovating their house or, you know, just a typical tenant kind of thing. So that's why we ended up going to... Uh, like a single family house versus like a resort setting. But um, plus you know, we like that area. And if we want to go down to Florida, it'd be nice to use it too. So. Oh yeah, exactly. So, and I, I guessing when you're, did you get that property right away? Like, is that where you stayed for those three? Oh no, you were driving all over the place. I was wondering if you actually. Yeah, stayed. we were all over the place. We actually, um, 
we ended up like we stayed uh we stayed basically all over the place but um we ended up checking out some properties like we basically i, I met uh someone else who was investing in florida and uh you know they set me up with a, a real estate agent who set me up with another real estate agent and we just you know they started making phone calls and calling people and just figuring it out right so yep. um one thing led to another and uh we ended yep. up buying an in cape coral just it, it, yep. like i said before like our dollar went a little further there versus like you know naples you're you're paying for the name essentially but like it's, it's beautiful there but you're paying for it so and, and like have you stayed in your own place yet yeah so when we were there we stayed at airbnbs like the first one we bought we ended up doing a, well both properties we did uh some renovations and stuff um but we were staying at other properties while we were doing it. And then basically we bought a bunch of furniture, moved in there. We stayed there at the one house for, I don't know, a couple of weeks before we went home. Um, just kind of getting everything ready. So. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then just cause you brought up hurricane Ian, I'm kind of curious about that. So depending on what neighbor you or neighborhood you are. So basically from my expertise of Cape Coral, if you were South of Cape Coral Boulevard, you basically got flooded. So um, how did your place hold up? <laughs> yeah, honestly, um, it's a miracle, to be honest. Um, <laughs> if you actually compare like Hurricane Ian to other hurricanes, um, like I think the last one was uh, Charlie and Hurricane Charlie fit in the eye of Hurricane Ian. So it just kind of puts in perspective how like the size of it. But um, both our properties are, they're actually in a flood zone and yep. we didn't get flooded at all. Fortunately, we have videos and pictures and stuff from our neighbors who were there and they kind of stuck it out. And uh, we had water basically up to the garage door, up to the door, the front door, but it never went inside. So we, you know, we had some damage with a pool cage and some shingles and a bunch of trees. Um, we had a, we had a palm tree in our pool, the one house. Yeah. Um, but honestly, compared to other properties that we, uh, we made out okay. So you you made up pretty good and you're Airbnb this so you could keep Airbnb this because I know being down there there I couldn't get a hotel or an, it was very difficult to even find an Airbnb so I'm guessing yeah. your vacancy level has been pretty good since yeah then. no like uh through the low season like before Hurricane Ian like before the hurricane came through you know it was your typical low season so it's a little spotty a little bit but but basically from now throughout we're, we're doing okay so even like i was a little concerned to be honest i'm like okay great hurricane you know now florida doesn't look necessarily like it used to um it obviously is going to take some time for things to come back to normal so i was a little concerned but people who have damage to their house they're renovating their houses they need somewhere to stay so like we're still renting it out we're still doing okay um, yeah. and yeah like it's still yeah like that's what i found like just being down there um, there's a lot of like contractors from all over the country. I saw trucks from Michigan and everywhere's else fixing stuff up and they need somewhere to stay. And okay. you need, you have all the typical, yeah, yeah. you know, people who are coming down a little early for the, before the high season, because the high season doesn't really start till December. Um, yeah. Early people coming down, uh, the regulars. And then, uh, you know, just people are displaced from their homes still. Uh, I toured a bunch of houses and they were like, had four feet of drywall cut off and all yeah. the way house right which, which was pretty yeah, common you know, uh, um, we have a friend that that has another place in cape coral and they were their their house was a little closer to the water and uh they literally just renovated the entire place and now they have to do it all again which you know it's unfortunate but <laughs> so that's awesome again. so you got this place you got a couple of uh, short-term rentals in cape coral um i guess you got someone local to manage that for you when I started investing in the U.S., I did it by myself and had to go through the growing pains of doing that. GlennSutherland.com slash coaching. A 12-week coaching program done one hour per week over Zoom from the comfort of your own home. Classes are kept to five people to be able to answer everyone's questions. Shortcut the process. Make fewer mistakes. Curriculum available at GlennSutherland.com slash coaching. Uh, no, so basically, I just I I'm, when we were there, um, we, we met you know a lawn care guy, a pool guy. Uh, we we got a couple contractors, handyman, uh, cleaners, that kind of stuff. We've already on our second cleaner. The first one didn't do too good. Um, so basically, we built up our contact list, and then we just self managed. So my 
my wife's actually been doing the majority of that. Um, and, but we're, you know, as things kind of get a little busier, we're going to hire basically a virtual assistant to take take care of like the day-to-day -day communication. But essentially like the pool guy comes once a week, the lawn guy comes once a week, the cleaner knows the schedule, it's all synced and it's, yeah, just let it rent and people That's do their awesome. thing. So what do you, for synced, like, do they have like a, an add-on for like the Airbnb app that will, you know, you can give to your cleaners or what do you mean? You have a separate app to do the. No, like, I think through Airbnb, like you can, you can get like a co-host, but we don't have that. We just link the Airbnb calendar with their calendar. Oh, so okay. basically when someone books like through Airbnb um, or VRBO is another platform. Yep. It literally just uploads into their calendar and they know, okay, so-and-so stay from here to here and. I got to be there to clean and that's that. So that's awesome. No, I, I, I'm always curious about that. I've always hired property manager for my short term yeah. rental. So I'm like, I'm always like, eh, maybe there, maybe there's a way to do this a little cheaper. Um, and I love it. Yeah. Right. Okay, the short term so rental, like the, the property management companies down there, they charge like, I don't know, I think it was like 15% or something, which I'm like, 15 or 20. I don't, I'm Dutch. So I'm like, there's got to be a cheaper way. Right. So <laughs> I'm Scottish, but I, <laughs> so I'm not, not, not much better about at least stereotypically wise. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, so you did the short term rentals, a couple of those. And then, uh, how's this transition? How, what do you, what do you go to next? So, um, yeah, like basically we were there, you know, enjoying Florida, which is, um, and then we seen the opportunity with the short term rentals, but, um, not that they're a bad thing. They're just obviously they're kind of. I always compare them to like a student rental. Like they're like there's more there's more involved. You know, you got weekly rentals and stuff, so there's more turnover and stuff versus you know a typical residential property where you're you know, you're sticking tenants in there and you're just letting them rent it and you know month after month and life goes on. So yeah. um, I don't know. I do all this real estate stuff like you know to basically free up my time and enjoy life and all that stuff. So. But at the same time, you want to do things that are profitable and scalable. So that's when I think at the, um, we were at that real estate mastermind. And that's yep. where I met you. I also met um, uh, my, uh, Joe. I don't know if you remember Joe, but. Um, yeah, yeah, I love Joe. Yeah. He's on the so, podcast as well. Joe Evangelista. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I hired him, I hired him as a coach. Um, and then, you know, one thing led to another. And, uh, and now we're, we're transitioning into, uh, self-storage developments. Um, we've seen an opportunity and, uh, I compared it similar to what I was doing back in, in Ontario. And, you know, I said, let's go, let's do it. Okay. So I know there's a couple of different ways to, to buy the self-storage. Um, are you buying the land and doing it right from start? Or are you kind of buying the like shovel ready? Um, so, so the first site. Yeah, so the first one we did, um, or we're doing right now, is shovel ready, but it's, you know, it's still, there's still some hoops and stuff that we have to jump through um, in order for it to actually get the shovel in the ground, but I think, you, you know, every time shovel ready too, because shovel ready may not sound, it may, may sound like turnkey and it's still not turnkey at all. Yeah exactly right so like every site some sites are different some are like boom shovel ready you can go and do it but there's other stuff that needs a little bit more due diligence and you're going to do a little bit more in order to get to that stage but um but essentially yeah like we um we partnered with joe um we're bringing them on you know to partner with and uh and yeah we're developing a site in, in texas um I don't know how much in detail you want me to go about, on about that site. Well, like, we keep saying the term shovel ready. So what, what does that mean? What, how far through the process is shovel ready? So I guess in a, in a perfect world, shovel ready would be like, um, here's a site. It's got permits. It's got drawings. You know, it's already got feasibility studies, geotech, environmental, all that stuff. You literally buy this shovel ready deal and you go. You hire your contractor and you start digging. Um, in our case, it's very similar to that, but we needed to, we have to finalize the drawings. Um, and then we had to tweak some stuff with regards to some, you know, some stormwater management stuff that we had to deal with. Um, and then we're, you know, once, once, once the drawings are finalized, you know, then we can build. So they're like I was saying before, like, it's just a little bit more to it. Um, but you're kind of fast tracking, uh, you know, doing all of the legwork ahead of time. Right. So you're. We found um, this piece of land with, with Joe and them um, that we basically, you can just, you're already like 75% of the way there. You know, yeah. they've done a lot of the legwork ahead of time. 
Cool. And then do they have the contractor lined up for that too? Or you have to find the contractor. No. So like we have to find the contractor, but we're working with them. Um, like we're leveraging them, their contacts and all that stuff. Like you know, I've reinvented the wheel in the past and it's, you know, it's, a lot of work. You know there's some headaches into it. So, yeah. well, you know, exactly. You know, oh, yeah. around markets, right. So, um, but yeah, so we're, we're leveraging them. Um, they're doing with some other sites in Texas too. So they already have a, a good contact list. So we're, you know, we're just, adding another site to it. Right. Right. No, that's awesome. Um, so involved in doing a big project less like this, it's going to involve getting some money. Um, what's the, uh, this isn't the kind of project you do on your own. <laughs> um, how does that work? Um, I'm guessing you have to raise a lot of money. Um, wh how are you, what's, what maybe talk about that a little bit. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, so basically this is a syndication, right? So, um, we're syndicating this deal. We're raising on this site, we're raising $3.1 million us, you know, and we're selling out shares to investors. Um, each investor gets, you know, we typically pay a 10% preferred return plus to get equity in the deal you know, and all the other stuff. So we essentially raise the money. Um, we're the general partner. Um, all of our investors are LP investors. And then, uh, and then one thing leads to another and we, you know, we get construction financing for the bulk of it. Um, but essentially we raise enough money to buy the land, get the ball rolling, um, you know, permits, drawings, all that stuff. And then, uh, and then start building it. Love it. And then what's the game plan for that? Um, Cause I, <clears throat> I interviewed lots of different syndicators. And so the, is the, the kind of game plan to do a refinance at a, a year three, a sale or what, 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 what do you plan on? how this project to run out. So yeah, that that's kind of the, the, the reason we, you know, we, we like these self storage, you know, syndication deals is because uh, you have, you have so many options to exit. Um, so like I'll back up a little bit, but sure. our property, like the stuff that we were doing in Canada, and Ontario before, like I was doing a lot of duplex conversions. Like I could buy a property, convert it, stick tenants in it, refinance it, you know, within four months and I'd be on to the next. So Everything was going great, but then, you know, things change, market goes up. What was a deal is now not a deal kind of thing. Um, so then that's what we were doing. And, you know, when we, we got on the idea of the self-storage and how everything works and syndications and all that stuff, it, it felt very similar to what I was doing, even though I'm comparing, a, 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 you know, a $500,000 duplex conversion to a $22 million self-storage site. The principle was the same. We're buying something, adding value and refinancing it or selling it or whatever. So, you know, our, our exit strategies on these self storage sites are basically, um, basically we've got three options. So one, we're going to sell it at CEO. So once we get our certificate of occupancy, typically 24 months, we'll sell them cash out and, you know, beyond to the next, yeah. um, or we'll stabilize it, which may take a little bit longer, um, and then sell it, or, you know, we'll stabilize it, refinance it, pull out a bunch of uh, equity, pay out, pay out the investors, but um, we usually keep the investors on like um, long-term, basically, as long as you own the property, they own equity in the deal. Um, but yeah. And then we distribute refi proceeds and find another site. Well, yeah. Start over again. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. What else should I have asked you about self-storage or uh, single family home or sorry, short-term rentals? <laughs> Or duplex conversions. Uh, what I don't know yeah. if you had some other stuff you had in mind you wanted to chat chit chat about. Yeah, I don't know. I guess um, well, being a podcast is you know Canadians investing in the United States. I guess we can dabble a little bit on that topic. But um, sure. like uh, you know, for your audience, I guess like when we bought some properties in Florida or now Texas, like honestly, we had no clue what I like. I had no clue what we were doing. Like I've <laughs> never you know we've never obviously we've bought properties and stuff in canada but you know doing it in a different country is completely different so um like i didn't even know what escrow meant you hear it on like hgtv but no yeah. idea what that was right? so you know we just seen an opportunity i did you know a lot of research all that stuff and I, we just bought one we just figured it out as we did it right so i think like that's a big hurdle people get stuck on is you know they get stuck on analysis paralysis they they try to you know out outsmart you know how to actually do something but in reality you you just have to do it and then once you do it then you you'll you know what was a problem is now not a problem and 
so on and so forth. Right. So that's essentially what we did with uh, the Florida stuff. Um, like we were going to buy something, we were going to buy the one property under an LLC. Like just, I called yeah. a lawyer and I started making phone calls and I'm like, okay, well you buy it under an LLC and life's great until you talk to someone else and you're like, okay, well now I'm going to get double tax. So do it under an LP. So like, there's just things that you don't really know until you actually do it. So, um, no, I had that exact but, thing whenever I bought my first property down there, I just went for it, bought some stuff, opened up an LLC, did a whole bunch of mistakes wrong, then had to get, you know, corporate structure fixed and adjusted before tax time. So that I didn't get myself yeah. in trouble um, <clears throat> because that's a lot of it. What, what it was, was, Go give it a shot and then figure out some of the the finer details and make it work, right? And then that's why I created the podcast five years ago. I'm like, uh, you know, I'm, I think there's a few other people that are probably going through the same thing as we're trying to do. Maybe we can uh, shorten this uh, learning process a little bit. No, yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, no, I, so basically, like, we've seen an opportunity with the short-term rentals. So we, we bought them. Obviously, I didn't anticipate a hurricane ripping through, but you know, that's part of it. Um, and then, uh, and then that kind of led us into doing the self storage stuff. Like, yeah, we've seen an opportunity, like when you like evaluate, you know, or compare like Canada versus us, we, I know I, I, that's where I seen an opportunity. Cause I'm like, you have way more people. Um, like, I don't know how many, there's like 300 and some odd million people in the U S versus Canada. There's what, 35 million or 36, whatever. Um, so you got way more people. And then on top of that, you got land value in the U.S. is substantially cheaper than Canada. So to me, I'm like, you got those two things. You got more people, cheaper value of land, and the average American, I, I believe, makes like on an average, makes typically they make a little bit more money. So I'm like, here you got more more money rolling in, more people, cheaper land. You know, that's where we kind of see an opportunity. So, yeah. and uh, and then the self storage stuff. I'm like, well. The, the site that we're doing, it's, you know, it costs $13.2 million to, uh, to build it like with the land yeah. and within 24 to 36 months, it's going to be worth $22 million. So, you know, 9 million bucks. in in that shorter time period, I was like, sign me up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's awesome. It's just, uh, I know for a lot of people doing, jumping into self-storage is a big step. Right. It's not, uh, oh, you're, yeah. not, you're jumping into the deep end. You're not, uh, you're going to have to raise money. There's no chance of doing this with yourself or even just a joint venture. You're going to be uh, putting so a lot of together. Markets or something, right? So <laughs> awesome. Uh, Nick, if uh, people want to reach out to you, uh, what's the best way to find you? Uh, probably the easiest is through Instagram. Um, NVD properties is my, uh, I guess, handle or whatever you want to call it. So, um, but yeah, Nick Van Dyke, NVD Properties, Instagram is probably the easiest. Um, yeah, feel free to reach out if anyone's got questions. Happy to help. Awesome. Thanks for coming on the show, Nick. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. Take care.